Welcome to the eSchool of the European Society of Gene and Cell Therapy. My name is Hildegard Bühning. I'm Professor of Infection Biology of the Gene Transfer at Hannover Medical School and currently the President of the ESGC team. The ESGCT is promoting fundamental and clinical research in gene therapy, cell therapy, and vaccine development. And education is part of our mission. Therefore, we launched the eSchool earlier this year. Today, we hear the last lecture in, this, in the area cancer gene therapy. And it's also the last lecture we have in our eSchool series. However, a good promise. In January, um, we are back with a new initiative, the ESGCT eSeminars, so please stay with us. Today, it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome to you Professor Chiara Bonini. She is Deputy Director of Immunology, Transplantation and Infectious Disease and heads of the Experimental uh, Hematology Unit. Chiara studied in Pavia and Milan, receiving there her PhD and MD. She um, then moved on as a postdoc at San Rafaele Teleton Institute for Gene Therapy and uh, started her own group in 2000. Before then becoming the head of the unit as a set of experimental hematology in 2008. Her focus is on development, preclinical and clinical validation of gene therapy cell or T cell based therapy approaches to treat cancer. And this is also the topic of today. We are looking forward to your talk here. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, introduction and thank you all for being here. So this is my title and these are my conflicts of interest. Now, we know that um, a tumor needs some properties and among these properties, they need to be able to avoid immune destruction. And this really tell us how important the immune system can be in controlling uh, cancer growth. Of course, this is not enough, but we might come with uh, modifications that will allow uh, the immune system to recognize properly cancer cells. I think that the entire field of T cell therapy is highly indebted to the field of allogenic stem cell transplantation. This is the most widely used form of cellular therapy, in which we infuse cells from a healthy donor to a patient with cancer, for example, with leukemia. And in other transplantation together with stem cells, we do infuse also lymphocytes. And we had the chance to um, quantify the potency of lymphocytes and their ability to recognize residual cancer cells, residual leukemic cells uh, within the what we call the graft versus leukemia effect. Uh, these come with a price, uh, the price of graft versus host disease, of unwanted responses against healthy tissues of the host, uh, and uh, from uh, uh, the need to spare GVL while uh, taming, controlling, eliminating GVHD. Many, many approaches were, were built and became uh, uh, cell-based gene therapy approaches. And today we can indeed uh, uh, identify and isolate uh, T cells for therapy from different sources through different methods, apheresis from tumor resection. We can even use bank T cells, universal T cells to be infused to patient. We can isolate some forms, we can expand the cells, and finally we can, we can genetically engineer these T cells. And among um, T cell engineering, uh, uh, gene engineering, uh, the most striking clinical results have been uh, obtained up to now with CAR T cells. I think we all know what CARs are, but let's uh, uh, brush up a little bit uh, uh, for the sake of a, a brief introduction. These are um, artificial molecules made uh, by scientists uh, composed by an antigen binding domain usually derived from antibodies which is uh, uh, fused to a T cell signaling domain uh, CD3 zeta in first generation or CD3 zeta with a, a co-stimulatory uh, moiety in second generation and third generation cars and finally four generation CAR T cells have been developed with a combination of, uh, of these with the addition of chemokine receptor, genes for cytokines and so on. And maybe we're gonna briefly talk, uh, talk about that uh, also today. Now with 
especially with second generation cars um, designed specifically to recognize CD19, so, uh, which is a, a lineage antigen expressed also by B cell tumors, um, striking clinical results were reported by different, uh, um, different PIs in different centers, mainly in the US. As you see from, the, uh, from this part of the, of the slide, the rate of complete remission, even in patients with very aggressive diseases, uh, relapsing after uh, several lines of therapy, in some cases also relapsing after allotransplantation, reached a complete remission, in some cases also uh, maintained, preserved long-term complete remission upon CAR T-cell therapy. And this really led to, I would say, a rapid uh, path of uh, registration for the first CAR T-cell products, rapid compared to the gene therapy field. So we have today commercial CAR T-cells that are used uh, in clinical practice. Interestingly, uh, this year, the first uh, results uh, in real life uh, were reported and published. This is important because clinical results obtained with trials are not always matched by real life uh, challenge. Uh, while this is not the case here in which uh, uh, overall response rate and complete rate remained high also in real life results with different products uh, um, tested, commercially available, so tested outside clinical trials. And together with responses, we also continue to observe, observe some toxic events uh, that we're going to touch in the last part uh, of this presentation. Now, saying that, what are the challenges that we need to, to face? I think they can be grouped in uh, four classes. The first one relates to the difficulty in some patients to see, uh, to see CAR T cells properly and grafting expanding, persisting enough to, uh, um, to promote and, uh, and sustain clinical responses. A second one relates to uh, cancer immune evasion uh, um, mechanism by which cancer cells um, change at genetical level and is then selected uh, to become resistant to our CAR T cells. Then there is toxicities uh, and finally uh, the um, possibility to exploit the experience observed with B-cell tumors also to other tumors. So let's start with the first one. Uh, how can we overcome uh, CAR T-cell failure that sometimes happen? Now, our first observation that has been made in different trials has been the, the fact that um, clinical efficacy usually associates with expansion of CAR T-cells. You see them expanding more in response patient than in non-responding patient, and also in most of the cases also with their persistence long term. Uh, I have to say that this observation has not been, has not been uh, uh, reported for all the products and in all uh, the clinical settings. For example, with AXI cells, uh, there have been reported of uh, a number of patients uh, uh, maintaining complete remission up to 24 months after, trans of, after uh, gene therapy, after the infusion, in the absence of persisting CAR T cells. So this might not be the case for all the trials, but in most of the trials, persistence have, have been uh, identified as um, a, positive, uh, a positive effect. So how can we uh, increase the persistence ability of CAR T cells and of T cell therapy in general? We have to start from the uh, observation that T cells come in different flavor. They uh, exit the thymus naive, but once they encounter the antigen, they will differentiate in effectors, uh, ready to kill uh, their targets, but prone to die. And in memory cells, that are actually the cells able to promote long-term persistence and surveillance against that specific target in, in a subject. So, if we want to promote persistence of CAR T cells and engineer T cells, uh, we might want to concentrate on these early memory T cells, such as memory stem T cells and central memory cells, which are indeed an endowed with the property, some property of stemness. They persist long term, and once they're re challenged with, the, with their antigen, they're able to differentiate in effectors, which are actually the cells devoted to killing and then prone to die. 
And we've studied memory stentesis in different contexts. Uh, we um, studied them in the context of transplantation and observed them arising from naive cells upon, uh, uh, upon uh, antigen recognition. We've identified uh, uh, protocols to manufacture genetically engineered T cells with the memory stem T cell properties. And I will say most importantly, um, we had the chance to uh, observe the fate of genetically modified T cells infused to patients in the context of suicide gene therapy for up to 14 years after, after transfer. And what we observed was that the cells that uh, uh, were still present, the genetically engineered uh, T cells that were still present and represented uh, the most abundant uh, genetically engineered cells uh, long-term were actually actually the one originated from memory stem T cells and central memory T cells infused with the product, really indicating that these two phenotypes are the ones associated to long-term persistence. And we have set up a number of uh, protocols to generate not only effectors at this point, but also central memory and memory stem T cell products uh, genetically engineered, applied to different uh, um, clinical uh, uh, possible applications, including uh, CAR T cells. And many others are, uh, are actually um, tested in, uh, in different clinical trials. Now, um, is it always possible to produce genetically engineered memory stem T cells? Well, the first uh, observation performed were performed uh, in vitro with uh, T cells uh, harvested from healthy donors. But in uh, um, CAR T cell therapy and in T cell therapy, we often use T cells that are ob obtained from uh, patients, from patients with uh, specific diseases, in some cases uh, pre-treated uh, with conventional chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and so on. So what about this source of T cells? The group of Monica Casucci has uh, uh, recently reported a comparison in the generation of CAR T cells with a protocol designed and optimized to have memory stem T cells. <clears throat> as the prevalent part of the, of the product, starting from healthy donors, from BALL patients, or from patients with pancreatic cancer. And what she observed was that it was indeed very difficult to obtain memory stem T cells. Here are the white part of the, of the column uh, from PDAC patients. They, the product from uh, uh, cells harvested from these patients were mainly effector memory and effector cells. And when we um, compared uh, these CAR T cells, they were CAR T cells expressing a CAR for CD19 as a model, model CAR, and we compared them in vitro, they all behaved pretty similarly. They killed uh, specifically uh, target cell lines, uh, they got activated once they observed the antigen, they produced cytokines uh, with uh, um, uh, at levels, at comparable levels. But the difference came uh, in in vivo models, in uh, humanized models in which we tested the different products, we observed that the products enriched uh, in early memory cells, such as the product that originated with healthy donor or uh, ALS cells were able to control leukemia even in stress tests, so high tumor burden, low CAR T cell numbers, while on the contrary, the cells from PDAC patients were not. So it is important to try to um, verify the phenotype of the cell product that we're using, and probably uh, it will be required to change the conditions of manipulation to ensure memory T cells also when we work uh, with T cells from highly treated patients. We're talking about T cells, we talked about memory T cells, but I have to say that T cells are not all in the car fields, uh, and memory T cells in particular are not all. I'm reporting here a paper published this year by the group of Andrea Biondi, in which patients were treated, uh, patients affected by ALL were treated with CIK6 cells uh, expressing a car against CD19 with very good uh, clinical results, really indicating that even effectors 
factors can really mediate important uh, uh, remission in a selected uh, in selected selected setting, at least in these settings. And going beyond T cells themselves, uh, um, I'm reporting here one of the paper um, exploiting a, a CAR and K cells, or so expressing a CAR into NK cells. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, patients with CLL and lymphoma were treated and again um, a good rate of overall response and complete responses were observed. Um, the failure uh, of the therapy can rely not only on, uh, on, on the product but also on the way by which the tumor cells evade immune responses. With CD19 this has been observed, a number of trials have shown how um, cancer cells can uh, uh, stop presenting uh, uh, CD19, or at least the epitope of CD19, which is recognized by CAR T cells, thus becoming uh, completely invisible by the CAR T cells themselves. And many mechanisms have been uh, revealed uh, genomic alterations in CD19, uh, alternative splicing. Uh, shutting down the exon coding for the epitope recognized by the CAR T cells have been, have been observed, or lineage switch, so a complete epigenetic change of the cancer cells will, that will stop being a B-cell tumor but become more similar to an AML, for example. And finally, trogocytosis, a mechanism by which the encounter between CAR T cells and, and, uh, and the target cells result in exchange of the membrane and, um, and transfer of the antigen to the CAR itself with reduced expression of, uh, uh, of CD19 on cancer cells. And I have to say for many uh, CAR T cell products, the level of expression of the antigen has been uh, observed as a major issue for good recognition. So uh, together with the identification of mechanisms uh, related to, uh, to immune evasion, also uh, new approaches have been designed. Uh, we can target more antigens by a CAR T cell approach, for example, for example, by expressing two different CARs specific for two different antigens, CD19 and CD22 has been, have been uh, tested, for example, on the same cells or by infusing two different products, uh, each of them specific for the different antigen. But no matter how, what is the strategy that we choose to use, we have to end up identifying new antigens if we want to uh, increase the level of efficacy and also of exportability of the entire approach. So antigen choice is, uh, is uh, critical. And the ideal antigen should be, of course, specific for cancer cells, as specific as possible. It should be expressed at high levels, or at least very higher levels compared to what is its uh, potential expression of healthy cell, on a healthy cells, it should be homogeneously expressed by cancer cells to avoid uh, immune evasion, as we said. And possibly it should have a role in, in oncogenicity or in tumor progression so that it becomes an antigen for which cancer cells are addicted and will not be able to shut down. Now it's not easy with CAR, uh, with CAR T cells to identify uh, many of these antigens and one of the reasons why it is not easy is because CARs recognize only antigen present on the surface of cancer cells. They cannot really dig inside the cells looking for um, intracellular antigens which might be relevant for, for oncogenicity and, uh, and, and tumor progression. On the contrary, a TCR approach, an approach which is based on the recognition of a small peptide presented by MHC, which is actually the natural mechanism by which T cells recognize their antigen, it's an approach that allows us to dig inside the cells. Uh, essentially, every a protein is uh, uh, processed and presented by MHC molecules independently on its location. So this approach might increase uh, the wideness of, uh, uh, of the library of uh, potential antigen on which we can dig and choose uh, uh, and, and apply to, uh, depending on the tumor type that we want to try to treat. And TCR gene, uh, 
uh, transfer and editing uh, has become uh, a new a new frontier for for the field. Um, how can we identify tumor specific TCR? There are not that many in uh, in uh, in circulation in uh, in patients, but it is but. But there are so we can start from a, a peripheral blood. We can start from tumors. If we start from peripheral blood, we can start from uh, peripheral blood uh, uh, samples from cancer patients or by uh, or from healthy donors. And by different ways, we can isolate and expand in vitro tumor-specific T cells. And once they're expanded enough, uh, we can sequence the TCR genes um, that they're encoding and then use them as tools for TCR gene transfer upon possible additional modification. Um, by this approach, uh, uh, we followed uh, a prioritization activity that was reported many years ago that identified uh, WT1 as one of the most interesting cancer antigen because of its high expression, its immunogenicity, because PCR against it are present in, uh, in healthy donors and, and cancer patients because it's of its role in uh, oncogenicity and also because of its expression on many uh, uh, hematological malignancies, but also on some solid tumors. And starting by um, healthy donors, uh, by, by T cells harvested from healthy donors and uh, um, stimulated in vitro with overlapping peptides, Eliana Ruggero in the lab uh, ended up with 19 TCR specific for different WT1 peptides, um, most of them restricted by the common HLA2 restriction element, but not only. And she's currently matching and uh, um, pooling these TCRs with a TCR specific for other tumor antigens and comparing the different TCR to end up uh, with the selection of leading TCR to be driven in clinical trials. Now, clinical trials with TCR redirected lymphocytes have already been published, first by Morgan in 2006. Uh, different tumor antigens have been, uh, have been uh, tackled by this approach. Uh, and um, in most of the cases, retroviral or lentiviral vectors were used to introduce uh, the, the TCR genes into T cells, and different diseases were also uh, were also um, tested uh, and, and treated into clinical trials with different levels of uh, uh, of response and toxicity. The level of response, I would say, in most of the cases was not as high as the one that we have observed with CAR T cells, and not even as high as the one that we we had observed with naturally uh, derived tumor-specific T-cells, which do actually use the tumor-specific TCR to recognize the antigen. And one of the reasons for this uh, might uh, uh, come from the fact that um, once we transfer tumor-specific TCR into T-cells, we'll end up with products that express not only our TCR, but also uh, the endogenous T-cell receptor. And this will lead to mutual dilution of the two molecules with possible reduced efficacy, and also to the risk of mispairing between the two molecules, which are dimers, uh, with the generation of Mm, unknown new specificities potentially autoreactive and risky. So to overcome this, uh, um, some years ago with Luigi Naldini, we set up a protocol of TCR gene editing, exploiting uh, uh, genome editing technologies. We started with zinc finger nucleases, but this can be performed also with Talon or with CRISPR as we're doing right now. And uh, mm, uh, genome editing relies on the possibility to build artificial molecules that will recognize selected target uh, uh, genome size, will create DNA double strand breaks, which will be uh, then uh, uh, repaired or by non-homologous joining, and then we'll have the disruption of the wanted uh, of the of the of the gene that we want to um, to target uh, or can be repaired by um, homologous uh, uh, repair system which will allow us to introduce a dna cassette and potentially the tumor specific tcr by this approach, we um, set up the TCR gene editing strategy in which we knock down initially, as I said, with zinc finger nucleases, the TCR genes, uh, the endogenous 
TCR gene, and then um, we uh, added the tumor-specific TCR by antiviral vectors. And with this approach, what we ended up uh, um, generating were uh, very specific uh, cellular products uh, expressing only the tumor-specific TCR, and so able to kill uh, an antigen-bearing uh, uh, target cells. So for example, a myeloma, uh, expressing uh, the NYISO antigen if the TCR used was against NYISO and engrafted in, uh, in NSG mice. And they could do it specifically. So in the absence of the endogenous TCR and in the absence of uh, the risk of sparing, no GVHD, no unwanted recognition was observed. Well, this was actually observed once uh, only a single TCR gene transfer approach was uh, uh, was. Uh, I was tested. As I said, uh, this work started in uh, uh, with zinc finger nucleases, but uh, with the availability of CRISPR-Cas9, much more user-friendly and uh, adapted to multiplexicity, we uh, moved to this technology and uh, set up two different protocols. In one, we uh, knock down the TCR alpha and beta gene and complement with lentiviral vectors the expression of the tumor-specific TCR. And with the second one, we enforce the integration of the tumor-specific TCR in the TRAC gene, which is disrupted while we're also disrupting the TCR uh, beta gene. So with one single manipulation step, uh, we obtain the three wanted effect. Both uh, um, protocols are highly efficient in disrupting uh, uh, the endogenous TCR alpha and beta gene and also in promoting the expression of the uh, tumor specific TCR. And uh, they do this uh, um, in a condition that maintain an early memory phenotype for the cells with central memory and memory stem T cell phenotype, which we said uh, we believe it's very important. So um, let's go to the third challenge that we need to face with uh, uh, with this approach, uh, with relates to toxicity. I would say that in cancer therapy, uh, no effective therapy has ever come without uh, toxicity and T cell therapy doesn't make the exception. Uh, and different mechanisms underlying toxicities uh, have been uh, unrivaled in, uh, in uh, recent years. Uh, for TCR approaches, I would say that uh, I think the most uh, important uh, uh, possible toxicity comes from cross-reactivity that has been observed uh, up to now only with uh, um, uh, affinity enhanced TCR, not with natural TCR. So we have to be prudent and very careful in, in the, um, the preclinical evaluation of enhanced affinity TCR, I think, today, since some of these uh, cross-reactivity were really not predicted and uh, um, and were uh, really toxic for, for treated patients. Uh, Misparing uh, between the tumor specific and the endogenous TCR is something that we have already talked about. On target of tumor, that is a, a mechanism of toxicity which is highly related to the type of antigen that we choose. Um, for example, B cell aplasia, usually observed with CD19 CAR T cells, is a non target of tumor. Uh, um, toxicity that we can predict uh, and that we can accept, but uh, this could be different with different antigens. And for sure, the most important uh, in, in terms of uh, frequency, a group of toxicities are cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity, which have been observed uh, um, preferentially with CAR T cells. Now, uh, CRS uh, is an event pretty frequent uh, with all the T cell, uh, the CAR T cell product, not only with CAR CD, uh, specific for CD19, it has been observed also with CAR specific for BCMA uh, used uh, uh, in clinical trials for the treatment of uh, multiple myeloma. And uh, it is an event uh, uh, characterized, it's, it's an early event uh, that occurs uh, at median of two days after the infusion of CAR T cells, uh, associated with uh, non-specific but almost always present uh, symptoms such as fever that open up the difficulty uh, for the differential diagnosis with other causes of fever, such as infection that is observed after CAR T cell infusion. It's associated with uh, um, 
uh, a number of uh, laboratory changes, cytopenia, high ferritin and CRP, high levels of interferon and IL-6 that help us in identifying the status. Um, in, and uh, uh, it can, in some cases, progress to life-threatening vasodilatory shock, capillary leak, hypoxia and end organ dysfunction. So it's clearly something that we need to take care of. It is in some cases followed by neurological events, which are uh, generally reversible. They are in most patients, but in some cases, long-term symptoms have been also observed. So I think the first thing we had to face, we still have to face uh, with new toxicities uh, uh, arising with new therapies, is to develop models that are able to recapitulate these toxic events uh, and allow us to study them, to identify mechanisms, and also to test drugs. And different uh, models have been proposed. I'm showing here two very similar models that were published back-to-back uh, uh, -back, uh, from the group of Bondance and the group of Michel Sutherland. And I'm going to show you what we did with our model um, uh, uh, developed by, by Attilio and Monica Casucci, in which they uh, humanized the NSG, SGM3 mice with hematopoietic stem cells, uh, healthy hematopoietic stem cells and leukemia. Uh, in these mice, we could promote uh, the, a good engraftment also of healthy cells and not only of leukemic cells, and then infuse CAR T cells to uh, show how in such a model, CRS occurs with weight loss and uh, increased level of IL-6 in animals. We could study at single cell level and identify monocytes as the major producer of these IL-6 and ended up seeing how monocyte ablation could rescue mice from CRS. And some, with some modification, also these models is able also to recapitulate neurotoxicity. And so we're trying to study also this toxicity in, uh, in this model. So the last uh, um, big challenge we have to face with this, uh, um, with this, uh, 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 with this cell therapy is how to export the experience initially positive for B cell tumors, also to other tumors, other hematological malignancies such as AML or to solid tumors. Now, for solid tumors in particular, it is uh, clear today that uh, T cell therapy as part of immunotherapy is becoming a pillar of uh, uh, cancer treatment, but still we are asking a lot to our infused T cells to do, to be a traffic to the tumor, to recognize the antigen, to control, so kill the tumors, resist the tumor microenvironment, which is almost always immunosuppressive through different mechanisms active in different tumors. And of course, we require them to persist long-term. Um, the, the antigen recognition, so again, uh, uh, the selection of the antigen is a major issue, especially for CAR T cells. As you can see from this slide, which is not updated, it's from 2017, but still, uh, I think, uh, um, of value. Um, the number of antigens and the number of clinical trials that we are uh, 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 testing that are active on uh, B cell tumors and on hematological tumors in general are, are much higher than the one that we have with solid tumors. And this is in part due to the difficulty in identifying the proper antigens in this case. Re let's remember that CD19 is not a tumor antigen, it is a lineage antigen. So we can spare a healthy B cells in this case and use it, but it's going to be much more difficult to use exactly the same strategy <clears throat> and target a um, uh, lineage antigen for solid tumors. So in this case, uh, possibly TCR approaches might be of great benefit. Saying that, I will contradict myself, showing you how we developed uh, with the Kazuchi and Bondanza um, a CAR T cell approach, which could be could have a value also uh, uh, for solid tumors. Uh, Attilio and uh, Monica decided to tackle CD44 variant six. Uh, CD44 uh, through different splicing methods uh, um, is present in in different isoforms. The standard one is 
ubiquitous, so it's not really a good target, but the variant six is expressed by many blood cancers. We developed these to tackle AML and multiple myeloma, but it's also expressed by several epithelial cancers, including uh, uh, the big killers. Um, and a CAR a specific for CD4406 was developed and tested at preclinical level. Uh, it has a CD28 uh, costimulatory domain. I'm showing here one uh, representative uh, um, preclinical result in which CAR T cells against CD4406 were able to eliminate leukemic cells in the context of high tumor burden, while of course uh, a control CAR against CD19 was, wasn't able to, to control the disease uh, in all these in an autologous setting. So uh, generating CAR T cells from uh, the same patients from which uh, the acute leukemia was, uh, um, was used as target. And through uh, many, uh, after many preclinical results, uh, a clinical trial started, is active. Uh, um, it is uh, um, promoted by uh, Molmed who took over the project. Uh, and uh, it's a multicentric, uh, multicentric studies uh, are rolling today. Uh, it suffered, the timeline suffered a little bit of the pandemic, but uh, we are continuing to enroll. Uh, and um, hopefully next time I will be able to tell Tell you tell you more about uh, uh, the clinical results. Now, uh, it is not only a matter of antigen, as we said, uh, uh, what we are asking to CAR T cells, especially in the context of uh, solid tumors, but also in hematological malignancies, is to be able to um, overcome the immunosuppressive uh, uh, environment that the tumor usually um, uh, is able to uh, orchestrate around uh, uh, around its niche. And this is true and has been uh, uh, broadly studied in solid tumors, but it's becoming more, its role is becoming more and more relevant also in hematological malignancies. I'm showing here a work from the Lu group of Luca Vago in which he studied um, leukemic blast at diagnosis and at relapse after allotransplantation, which is, as we said, the most strong uh, immunological pressure that we can um, that we can place to a tumor cell. And what you observe was that approximately one third of the relapse, in one third of the cases of relapse, BLAST had started to express at relapse ligands for immune receptor, for immune checkpoints. So um, triggering a, a senescence in recognizing uh, T cells. And on the other hand, by studying uh, T cells present in the bone marrow transplanted patients, we observed a very similar thing. We observed how uh, T cells present in the bone marrow of a patient who relapse after allotransplant express high level of inhibitory receptors such as 2B4, PD1, CTLA4, and so on. And this expression was clearly higher in T cells uh, present in the bone marrow of relapsing patient compared to tissues present in the bone marrow of patients in complete remission or in patient or, or in bone marrow of healthy donors. And it was present not only in effector cells, the blue part uh, of, uh, of these slides, but also in memory cells, in central memory and memory stentesis, really telling us that um, the uh, immunosuppression mechanism and senescence might occur also in memory cells. So we'll have to take care of it, even if we uh, infuse uh, early memory uh, CAR T cells or TCR edited T cell products. How can we deal with that? Well, we can uh, com combine adoptive T cell therapy with checkpoint inhibitors as they are combined with diff many different uh, uh, cancer treatment approaches. And this is for sure one of the activity that is ongoing uh, uh, in different trials, especially a uh, combination of checkpoint inhibitors with CAR T cells. Or uh, we might decide to exploit even more the gene transfer and gene editing tools that we know how to use. And this, uh, this is what was done, for example, in this paper published by the group of Carl June, in which he infused the TCR edited TISA specific for NYSO1, and um, uh, in which PD1 gene was disrupted to cancer patients. Uh, 
showing that it is indeed feasible, uh, a strategy of uh, um, T-cell transfer with multiple editing in the genome of the T-cell product. And I think uh, that I'm gonna finish really with, this, uh, uh, with these slides that tell us how genome editing and how CRISPR in particular are really helping us in shaping different products designed for different disease. We can not only add a gene, we can not only add a CAR or two TCR chains, we can disrupt genes, we can force the integration of uh, selected genes in uh, known and ident well identified uh, um, uh, genetic regions, and this is currently tested for the design of different trials. So really, our ceiling is our creativity. So I'll end up by summarizing what I said to you. Adoptive T-cell therapy is a personalized, precise medicine with specific scientific and regulatory hurdles. Uh, the choice of target antigens is relevant. We need to work on effectors helping these cells to home to proper size, persist and resist the immunosuppressive microenvironment. We need to continue to find uh, an optimized measure to predict and control potential toxicities and test these measures in appropriate models. And we need to do all this in a sustainable way and prepare ourselves to automation and standardization to be able to offer those products that really make the difference and prove to be effective to the largest possible number of patients. And this might be helped by uh, the development also of universal allergenic T cell products. So I'll end up with uh, uh, thanking all uh, um, the collaborators. I think I've mentioned some of them, all of you for your attention and I'll ask uh, Hildegard to uh, moderate in the hope of getting some questions from you. Thank you very much, Chiara. This was a wonderful talk. And um, I would like to remind the audience that you please just type in your questions, which I then will tell Chiara for the start of the discussion. However, let me, let me start. If it, is it possible that you go back to your nice overview about the genome editing um, tools which are available for you? Yes. So this is a lot. And as you said, it's uh, due to the development in the field, you have this toolbox available. So, but the, the question is how to decide what to do. So um, can, can you guide us here a bit? How, what is the best, yeah, how would you de define which one to choose from this repertoire of tools? Well, yeah, I think um, ideally what we should uh, end up with uh, is really a number of tools that have been validated. Of course, the initial validation will come from, uh, from different uh, reasoning, I mean, the type of disease, uh, um, the administration of therapies required, I, I think, for example, of the use of uh, uh, CRISPR to knock down or talent to knock down CD52 in case alentuzumab is used. So we're gonna validate them in different diseases, taking into consideration not only the disease, the pro problem of the disease, but also the standard of care of that disease that can be sometimes helpful, sometimes a problem on which we can work uh, through genome editing. But at the end of the day, what I'd like to, and I hope to see is a number of validated uh, tools that we can combine. And we can combine uh, in uh, uh, different uh, associations uh, to really design the proper therapy for each of our patients. I'm not saying this will come tomorrow, but I think this should be the frontier, the horizon uh, that, we, that we look at. Do you see this combination or the use of genome editing in particular for those um, cells which will be later on off the shelf? Or can we envision that you can do it really individually with the cells from the patients then? 
that will largely depend on uh, the need that we have to um, restart from the beginning every uh, validation of a new combination or on the possibility to combine more easily what has been already tested, I think, first. Uh, it depends on uh, um, the ability that we, and I would say also our um, industrial partners uh, will have in uh, making Uh, uh, of the genome sustainable and doable so for uh, for T cells uh, of uh, of each patient. Um, I'm not I'm not against the universal CAR T cells. I've, I've mentioned them, and I I'm really interested in seeing what will be the the um, the fate of universal products. Um, what, the only concern I have uh, is uh, related to their ability to persist long term. In some way, we, we might make these cells uh, less uh, visible to the immune system um, and in some way self-sufficient in terms of uh, ability to, uh, uh, to grow and expand. I'm not sure we're going to really be able to um, uh, to make them as fit as autologous T cells. I mean, uh, exclude the field of uh, allotransplantation in which donor T cells persist, but there is the entire hematopoietic system that is from the same donor and that allow them to persist. So uh, there might be um, cases uh, in which Killing is enough and we don't need persistence long-term. Let's go back to the observation with axi cells uh, in some clinical contexts in which the infusion induced probably such a profound response that even in the absence of uh, detectable CAR T cells, we continue to see a complete remission. In that case, probably universal uh, product uh, will be more than enough and will probably even be better. Uh, but in those cases in which we, we know we need to promote uh, long-term surveillance, then I think that still uh, we are not able to play with immunology enough to have a product that can lead to that. It might come in the future. What about uh, in vivo modification then? Oh, Did this you is directly... interesting. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very interesting frontier. Uh, it was uh, it was proposed some years ago, but I, I'm seeing more and more interesting uh, reports uh, in uh, in recent years, also this year. I have to say, when it was proposed first, the idea of uh, uh, doing an in vivo, which was um, an approach which was not as efficient uh, as uh, the ex vivo gene transfer at the time, applied to cells that are so easily manipulated in vitro, such as T cells. I, I was not completely convinced that the difficulty was uh, that it worsened. Actually, today, I'm I totally changed my mind. I think that we are much more able to, we, we are much more efficient in in vivo gene transfer on one hand. And, uh, uh, and I think that also the costs related to ex vivo manipulation are so high that the in vivo uh, approach might be a solution, at least for some, some products. Of course, in vivo we're required to go with a single vector to modify everything that we need. So it will probably be more uh, apt for a um, simple product than uh, for, to more engineered, uh, you know, uh, triple genome editing plus addition will be more difficult. But um, in these cases, I think uh, it could be a very good solution for many aspects. I mean, with regard to in vivo, you could also think about that you target at the same time different parts of the tumor, if, in particular, if you think now of solid tumors, right? So with regard to the T cells, I, I agree, it's maybe that you have to do it in a more simple way, but you could also uh, do at the same time a modification of certain cells of the tumor and microenvironment plus a T cell, right? Oh yeah, the, the combination of uh, uh, of in vivo with T cell uh, therapy with an in vivo approach that changes the microenvironment uh, and, and not necessarily the T cells. Oh, that is definitely a, a frontier. Actually, we are 
we are um, co through collaboration we are testing uh, this combination and its its results are really really promising but even the use of in vivo to modify the t cell i think it's it's coming to age um yeah thanks um this is i think a very interesting view in particular if uh, for people who are developing um, vectors for in vivo gene therapy, of course. And I think um, this also brings me to, to one point, which is always very important when it comes to gene therapy, how, how important it is really to have this interdisciplinary um, collaborations. Um, you, you said also uh, with regard to identifying targets uh, for the uh, TCR and so on. So I think this is something which uh, really comes uh, it's more and more visible, and in particular in the area of gene therapy, right? Totally. I think that we learned uh, maybe earlier than other scientists uh, how um, the collaboration between very complementary expertises is uh, critical to start from the idea and get to a trial, a successful trial. And uh, I have to say, we have a CAR team um, in the Institute that was uh, <clears throat> promoted by Fabio Ciceri that includes a gene therapist, uh, but also um, uh, ICU experts, uh, cardiologists. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really wide. So not only on... Uh, um, we don't only need uh, uh, complementary expertise on the scientific level, but also at the clinical level at one point. And we are um, in the Institute, uh, there is an, an ongoing project that I'm, uh, I'm uh, leading, uh, uh, funded by the Italian Association for Cancer Research, uh, in which 18 different groups uh, coming from gene therapy, immunology, tumor models, up to surgeons, and oncologists are working together for seven years to try to develop new products. And, and we are really um, benefiting uh, uh, It's fun to, to work with uh, people who come from completely different expertises and point of views. This sounds so let's perfect. Mingle, let's mingle, mix and mingle as much as we can. This sounds absolutely perfect. And I think it's it's a nice last sentence for our series and also for this great talk of you. And I again would like to thank you. And I would like to thank our, our audience participating in the eSchool and also in the lecture today. And I would like to announce that uh, we start in January with a series of e-seminars which uh, are really then mini series on a specific topic. And uh, we would like to start off um, with gene editing then in January. So uh, with this, I would like to say goodbye and uh, thank you all and uh, wish a nice day and time. Bye-bye. Happy holidays. Thank you. Happy holidays. <laughs>